if you're visiting with us today, we've been going through the book of Luke. And it's been a fascinating study, just bending deeper into the Word of God and understanding Jesus' ministry a little bit more. And yes, they're getting the baptistry ready on over there. Now, last time we were in chapter 4 of Luke, and we talked about how Jesus came into his hometown there at the synagogue, and he read from the scriptures in the book of Isaiah, and he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me and has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Jesus had a divine destiny in his heart. The people sensed that, and later on we read in the scriptures, the people were amazed because his message had authority. And we talked about that little story about Abraham Lincoln going to church with the Secret Service agents. And he went to church, and after the sermon, they'd gone to see one of the most well-known preachers of that day, a man named Dr. Gurley. And the Secret Service agent asked Abraham Lincoln, he says, well, what did you think of the sermon? And he said it was articulate. It was thought-provoking. It was powerfully delivered. But it failed. And the Secret Service agent was taken aback. Well, what do you mean, failed? He says, it failed to ask anything great of me. In all of Jesus' sermon, he never failed. And so today, the title of the lesson is simply this. The authority to challenge. Let's get to Luke chapter 5. This chapter breaks up very neatly into five sections. And so... We have five challenges today. Let's begin reading in verse 1. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Genesaret, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. There he sat down and taught the people from the boat. Now right here, we see that Luke is setting everything on up right here. He's saying, Jesus came to the Sea of Galilee, and there were tons of people. People were crowding all around Jesus, and they were listening to the Word of God. In other words, he's putting onto us a sense of Jesus preaches the Word. Amen, guys? And we see that there was such a large crowd that Jesus was having trouble having everybody here. And so he spies out... Simon's boat, and it wasn't by chance, of course, but he spies out Simon's boat and says, hey, let me get in that and let me preach to people because the water becomes kind of a a natural application system. Amen, guys? Verse 4. When he finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered him, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled the boat so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I'm a, I'm a sinful man. For he and all of his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they'd taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you'll catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Amen? Now we we understand this is not the first meeting of Jesus and Peter and the gang. As a matter of fact, they probably met some three months, six months, maybe even a year earlier down in Judea at the great revival of John the Baptist. And there, that's where those guys were baptized. Now this is about six months, a year later, And they're back up in Galilee. And so right here we find this interaction. And yes, Simon is singled out a little bit later to be called Simon Peter. Why? Because he becomes the leader of the early church. And Luke is trying to set that up in our minds. And it's quite an interesting and a fascinating study right here. Because right after Jesus preaches, and you say, well, what did he preach about? Well, I think he's going to demonstrate it's all about faith. Amen, guys? And he tells uh, Peter, he says, hey, put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Now, the deep water is where the biggest fish are to be caught during the night. 
But Peter comes back and says, man, we've worked hard all night and we haven't caught anything. And I'm sure in Peter's mind goes, hey, you're just a carpenter. I'm a fisherman and I know what I'm doing with my life. He says, but because you say so, I'm going to do it. They let down the nets. And can you imagine the sense right there? All of a sudden, whoa! All these fish come into the net. There was such a large number of fish. The nets begin to break. They signal their friends on shore, uh, James and John, to come on out. They're pulling in the nets with all the fish. The fish are filling up both boats so that both boats are starting to sink. Now, you know the crowd is still on the shore and thoroughly enjoying this scene. And then all of a sudden, it just hits Peter. Oh, my gosh. I am in the presence of... Of God. In the midst of all this chaos, he simply falls down, and his first reaction is, Lord, Lord, get away from me. I'm a I'm a sinful man. Because most people's concept of holiness is you cannot be in the world. And Jesus, being the Son of God, simply says, Do not be afraid. From now on. You'll catch men. You know, right here is a very challenging scripture for the average churchgoer. It's what does it really mean to follow Jesus? Well, the first challenge is very simply this. Put out into deep water. Put out into deep water. In other words, you've got to get over your head where you can't touch the bottom. And this was the challenge that, that Jesus gave to Peter. And because he had enough faith to obey him, and that's what it means to have faith, is to trust and obey, he went out into the deep water, and then they got this galactic catch of fish. Now, we know that Luke looked at Mark's gospel in order to be able to pattern his gospel. And there is an account early on in chapter 1 where there's a one-on-one interaction with Peter where Jesus says, Come and follow me, and I will make you a fisher of men. And at first glance, we say, well, this is pretty much the same thing happening. Well, yes, it's the same event, but it's absolutely emphasizing quite a different teaching. Now, Jesus wanted it clear that to follow him was to be about his mission. And people who claim to be followers of Jesus that are not about our mission are not true Christians. And right here, there's more to be gotten. Not only does he call upon us to have the idea that as fishers of men, we're to save people, but there's the whole idea of gathering people to do the will and the work of God. That's why he emphasizes this incredible catch, let alone the miracle that was there, amen? And notice he also talks about the fact that the nets broke and the ships were sinking. In other words, you cannot do the work of God by yourself. It is indeed God's work, and God is working through people. I think the other thing that's amazing is that in the midst of chaos, Peter sees Jesus for who he really is. You know, a lot of people, their lives are so chaotic that they they miss Jesus. Even today, I'm sure that some of us had a question. Are we going to go? Are we going to go? Are we going to go? Let me tell you something. God wanted you here to see the real Jesus. Are you with me right here, church? You know, I, I'll never forget, just a few weeks ago, we had a, a young woman that was baptized. Her name is Michaela Foley. And she got up here, she's 19 years old, and she just bared her soul. I mean, she was crying. She was so moved. Now, she'd been raised in the church, and she'd heard a bunch of sermons. But now, she was meeting Jesus. She got open about the sin that was in her life. The drugs. The immorality. The emptiness. She even got open about the fact that she'd been suicidal. And wishing sometimes she'd just go to sleep and not wake up. And she was excited to be saved. We're all excited to get our sins forgiven. Amen, guys? But I'll just never forget it. Right at the end, she had two of her best friends sitting in, in the crowd. And in the midst of this understanding of really coming to Jesus with her own personal faith, 
She calls out the names of her two best friends. He says, and I want to make sure that both of you go to heaven with me. You see, she had a concept not only of rescuing, but gathering. Are you with me right here? You know, it was awesome. This past weekend, Elaine and I had the opportunity to go out to Washington, D.C. to be a part of the Washington, D.C. mission team meeting. And it was incredible. The, the team is essentially being set out from Syracuse, New York, but there are other disciples that are joined from a few other churches. And uh, the leader of the team is just, he's one of the most dynamic young preachers in our fellowship is Andrew Smelly, and he happens to be African-American. And so is his wife, and so is the song leader, and so is pretty much the whole team. <laughs> and so, in our fellowship, we build mission teams so that we can reach out to the entire demographics of a city. And... I said, well, Andrew, you know, bro, we're, we're going to have to have, you know, a few white people on the team right here. <laughs> he goes, yeah, I knew something was missing. <laughs> so we're sitting around, and this is Thursday night, and, and we're sitting there, and he said, man, who can we invite? Because in, in, in L.A., we're, we're sacrificing a lot to, to send out the mission teams from here. And Lady goes, I know. Chuck and Elizabeth Hess in Corvallis, Oregon. Yeah. They fit the bill. They're white, and he's a song leader. <laughs> well, I tried to call him Thursday night. Couldn't get through, because he was in finals. Got a hold of him Friday morning. Chuck, how you doing? <laughs> bro, good. I said, bro, we're out here in D.C. He says, yeah, I heard. And, and we're out here, and, and we're building the mission team. And I think the Lord put it on Elena's heart to, to maybe have you guys be on the mission team. Would you be interested? He says, oh, wow. Yeah, I think that, that we might. You know, I'm right in the middle of my finals and everything. I said, well, th there's one other thing we were thinking, is that maybe you could join the meeting tomorrow, just fly on out. <laughs> he goes, you're that serious? I said, absolutely. <laughs> the next day, they got on a plane, wow. and by 5 o'clock, they met us at the Lincoln Memorial. <laughs> After a night of prayer on Sunday, they decided to join the D.C. mission team. Is that incredible? You see, they understand that being a Christian, being a disciple, is not about just going to church. It's not about just the morality of life. It is about being about the mission to change the world in Jesus' revolution. You know, the amazing thing about uh, Michaela, as young of a Christian as that she is, is that uh, she's on the New York City mission team. <laughs> and I, I think about the mission team that's going out from here and the kind of hearts that are on it, just like Chuck and Elizabeth. I think about DJ and Casey leading the team. Then Dustin and Amanda Miller on the team. Rachel Bond, Chris Van Staten from South Africa. Zach Nahor, Jared McGee, Gordo Espinosa, Mikey Mathis, Vic Gonzalez of Ventura, amen, Sean Dobbins, and Wes Harding. Yes, Michaela's on team, but you remember the two girls she said she wasn't going to let them get away, but wanted to take them to heaven? One of them was a girl named Ashley Woody who just got baptized. She's on the mission team. And then, just last week, Tanisha Carruthers, the sister of Amanda Miller, got baptized, and she's on the mission team. You see, see, these disciples understand that walking with God is to be about His mission to change the world. How about you? Are you ready to put out in the deep water? Point two. Let's move on. Beginning in verse 12. <clears throat> While Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. Can you imagine that? When he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I'm willing, he said. Be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Lepers were outcasts. As a matter of fact, if they tried to re-enter society, 
they would be killed. This guy was so desperate that he was willing to risk his life to meet Jesus. You know, lepers, they're terribly, and from a worldly perspective, grossly disfigured. I'll never forget, back in 1982, my first visit to India. I landed in the middle of the night, about one in the morning. You walk off the plane, and from a Westerner's point of view, there's just a stench that almost bowls you over. And I was tired, and I got into a taxi. As we're coming out, there are many beggars. And all of a sudden I turned and there was this, this man who had his face right up against the window asking for money. And he was a leper. And when I looked at his face, where his nose was to be, there was just a round hole. And when he held out his hand, there were no fingers. And my response, sadly, was to draw back. And yet Jesus was just the opposite. He sees this man that's covered in leprosy and he reaches out and touches the man. Someone once said, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. This man was disfigured, had lost his health, family, friends, home, livelihood. And yet in Jesus there was still hope. You know, this kind of complete and immediate healing would have fascinated Luke, the physician. Because we've talked about before, the Greek word to heal is exactly the same word as to save. Sozo. And so, in this sense, this man is saved. Now, interestingly enough, the passage goes on. And in verse 14 it says, Then Jesus ordered him, Don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Yet the news about him spread all the more, so that the crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Well, the first command that Jesus gave was, be clean. But then, interestingly enough, he gave him a second command, which is to offer the sacrifices. Now, we know from the Mark text that in actuality, this man didn't do it. He was so fired up about being cleansed of his leprosy, he just tells everybody about Jesus. But Luke includes the command for a very important reason. It's summed up in that last part of verse 14. He says, I want you to go show yourself to the priest as a testimony to them. Now part of the testimony, yes, was the healing, but there was something more that Jesus wanted the priest to understand. Let's look what the Bible prescribed in the Old Testament that this man was supposed to do once he was healed of his leprosy. Turn to Leviticus chapter 14. Come on, Deb. Come on, Deb. To be restored took about a week. But the first part of the process, you will see why Jesus wanted this leper to go show himself to the priest. In verse 1 of chapter 14. The Lord said to Moses, These are the regulations for the diseased person at the time of a ceremonial cleansing, when he is to be brought to the priest. The priest is to go outside the camp and examine him. If the person has been healed of his infectious skin disease, the priest shall order that two live clean birds and some cedar wood, scarlet yarn, and hyssop be brought for the one to be cleansed. Then the priest shall order that one of the birds be killed over fresh water in a clay pot. He is then to take the live bird and dip it, together with the cedar wood, the scarlet yarn, and hyssop, into the blood of the bird that was killed over the fresh water. Seven times he shall sprinkle the one to be cleansed of the infectious disease and pronounce him clean. Then he is to release the live bird into the open fields. That's just the beginning of the process. So the priest would receive 
This person that was cleansed of leprosy. And then he would take into his hands the first offering, which were two live birds. He'd have water. Thank you for the sound effects there. (laughs) Various things we put in. And at the very end, the priest would take the one bird and literally twist his neck totally off allowing the blood to spill out of his body into the cup. The priest would then dip his hand into the cup of blood and sprinkle seven times. In other words, complete healing over the person that had been cleansed. And then the second bird, the Bible says, is to be then released into the open field. You see, the Old Testament is the physical foreshadowing of the New Testament realities. Yes, Jesus wanted this priest to understand that a miracle had been done. But he also wanted to foreshadow what Jesus was going to do to heal, to save people. Jesus would be like the bird that had his head wrenched off and killed. And his blood would be that which would be shed so that we could fly free. When Jesus was on the cross and he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those were not empty words. Isaiah says that sin separates a man from God. Jesus had never been separated from God because he never sinned. But at that point on the cross, he takes upon himself all of our sins, all of mankind's sins of all ages, and for the first time, he feels that separation. And he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then he dies. Now, we're here Easter Sunday for a reason. Amen. Because on the third day, Jesus resurrected. Amen? Amen. And that's what baptism is all about. A person has faith that Jesus can save them. That Jesus can heal them. And then they're baptized in the water. Where they contact the blood of Christ by sharing in his death and raised to a new life. You know, it's interesting that Jesus reached out to the priests, the opinion leaders of that day. And the reason was, is because if you can get an opinion leader to become a disciple, they'll bring a lot of their friends and those they influence. Amen? I mean, it impacts people. And I think, I just think back just a few weeks ago when Osa Rashan was baptized. A quarterback there at UCLA. I mean, it's incredible. I mean, every baptism is awesome because to God, every soul is equally important. Amen? But sometimes in our humanness, we we go, oh, wow. You mean even a quarterback feels his need for God? And you know, when he came on out of that water, there was such joy. Because he contacted the blood of Jesus. And now, like the second bird, he was free to fly. The second challenge, oh, it's one that all of us want to obey. Be clean. Some of you, you're just coming to church and go, wow, man, this church is serious. Absolutely. We go by the Word of God. That's why all of our members have Bibles. We take notes. Because just because I'm up here talking doesn't mean it's true. We encourage every single person to go back and check out what is said. Now, if it is true, then it's not the words of some graying, old, long-haired preacher. (laughs) It is the Word of God. And the Word of God has authority to change our lives. Are you with me right here? Some of us have been coming to church for a long time, and we've been studying and studying. And now it's time to make the decision to be clean, to be baptized. Amen? Amen. Let's get back to our text in Luke. Our 
Our third challenge combines two commands that Jesus gives. Is walk. Your sins are forgiven. We're going to pick this up in verse 17. One day as Jesus was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law who had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem were sitting there. And the power of the Lord was present for Jesus to heal the sick. Now let's just stop right there. We know the parallel passage right here is Mark chapter 2. And we know the city that this takes place in is Capernaum. But to Luke, that doesn't make any difference. He's trying to get us to see the incredible impact that Jesus' ministry is beginning to have. Not only are the crowds coming locally, but now the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees and teachers of the law, they're coming from every village in Galilee, all the way from Judea and even Jerusalem, 70 miles away, just to hear this preacher preach with authority. And then seemingly in contrast to this, because this in time would be those that would oppose him, amen? It says, and the power of the Lord was present for Jesus to heal the sick. And we understand that all through the Gospels, there's a common theme. It was hit on a little tiny bit the last time we got together in Luke chapter 4, which talked about in Jesus' hometown, he could do no miracles because they had no faith. And so we understand where there is no faith, there could be no miracles. But the Bible says right here, This wasn't the case in this particular setting. In this setting, there was the power to heal. There was faith somewhere amongst that crowd. Let's keep reading. Verse 18. Some men came carrying a paralytic on a mat and tried to take him into the house and lay him before Jesus. When they couldn't find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles in the middle of the crowd. Right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, aha, there it is. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, Why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sin is forgiven or get up and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he'd been lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were all filled with awe and said, We have seen remarkable things today. That's just what happened when you hung around Jesus long enough. We know from Mark's text that there are four men that had this crippled friend. They came to the place that Jesus was preaching, this house, and it was just packed out. And they wanted to get their friend to Jesus, believing that Jesus could heal him. And so these men were not going to be stopped. They said, I got an idea. They go up on top of the roof of the house that Jesus was preaching in. Mark says they dug through the clay. Luke says they lifted the tiles. So they lifted the tiles up and they started digging through the clay. Right above where Jesus was preaching. Now can you imagine if you're inside the house, Jesus is cranking on some killer point. And all of a sudden the roof starts crumbling on down. And then this guy is lowered on his stretcher by these ropes right in front of Jesus. And then you see four heads peek over in the hole. He sees their faith, and I think with a smile, goes, Friend, your sins are forgiven. Now you remember who was in the crowd? Pharisees and teachers of the law. And they go, I can't believe it. This guy's blaspheming God. Only God can forgive sin. Of course, Jesus knew what they were thinking. 
like he knows what we're thinking. He says, uh, hey guys, let me ask you a question. Which is it easier to do? Forgive a man of his sins or say, get up and walk. You see, in a way of speaking, you could say, I forgive you of your sins. And, and you can't really see the tangible change. You know, people don't change their faces or nothing. But Jesus says, well, which is easier? Well, only God can forgive sins, so the easier thing must have been to heal the paralytic so he could get up and walk. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He said, get up and walk. Your sins are forgiven. That guy was flat fired up. He was flat fired up. Sometimes in the midst of our Bible study, if we don't know the Old Testament, the zingers in Jesus' preaching don't hit our hearts. There is a zinger in verse 24 that each one of those Pharisees and each one of those teachers of the law had at least an inkling about. Now, who were the Pharisees? Well, the Pharisees... They're one of four different groups amongst the Jews. You had the Pharisees, the Essenes, the Zealots, and the Sadducees. The Pharisees basically, you know, didn't want the Jews to meld on in to the Romans' uh, population. They were a separatist movement. And their whole goal was to keep the people pure before God. And so they wrote what we call the traditions that weren't specifically outlined in the scriptures on how to fulfill those scriptures. And the teachers of law were the scribes that, in actuality, wrote these things down and recorded them. And so they knew the scriptures very well. And in verse 24, Jesus is talking to them right after he gave the command, get up and walk, he says, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take up your mat, and go home. This is the first time Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man. Now, that's the most common reference that Jesus makes about himself all the way through his ministry. That's what he calls himself the whole time. Well, yes, it's a little bit of a reference back to Adam, as we talked about before. But it has a much greater impact than that. At first, everybody thinks, Book of Ezekiel! Because it occurs 93 times in the book of Ezekiel. And so Jesus has referenced himself as a prophet. But then, they think, oh yeah, but there's another book, and there's another reference. You don't think he's inferring Daniel chapter 7. Let's go look. Verse 13. This is Daniel. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days, God, and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. I, Daniel, was troubled in spirit. Sometimes God troubles you. And the visions that passed through my mind disturbed me. Jesus is a disturbing personality in history. I approached one of those standing there and asked him the true meaning of all this. So he told me and gave the interpretation of these things. The four great beasts and the four kingdoms that will rise from the earth. But the saints of the Most High will receive the kingdom, will possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. And for those of you that have been through the kingdom study, you know what the four kingdoms are. Babylonian kingdom, Medio persian kingdom, Alexander the Great's kingdom, and of course, the Roman Empire. But he says something greater. These things are going to pass. But something greater is going to come when the Son of Man comes on the clouds. There's going to be an eternal kingdom that is set up. You know, preaching sometimes has 
It's tough parts where you got to stay up late on Saturday night and do a little bit of work. But sometimes it has its fun parts. It's that you get to stand up here and watch people's reactions. And it's a very interesting thing. If you've spoken in front of crowds, you know this to be true. Sometimes there, there are certain people in the crowd that just kind of catch your eye. Yeah. Not the ones that are sleeping, you know, not others. <laughs> but there's a certain intensity. And sometimes you look at someone, you go, he's disturbed. <laughs> That's what I've seen since the first inaugural servants of a man named Terence Scotton. Terence had a just a, a disturbing countenance. And I think he's not going to come back next week and take any more abuse. And there would be two or three weeks. Sometimes we wouldn't see Terrence and Elaine. But then he'd come back. Yeah, yeah. All happy. And then at the end of the service, disturbed. <laughs> see, they have been together for about 12 years. They have a common law marriage. But they've never been married until this past week. inside of him. I mean, his dad was a preacher. His brother, a true disciple. Terrence was the Serb. <laughs> I mean, after all, there's a lot of money to be made. Yeah, sure. And sometimes you have to cut a few corners. And you can't do that if you're a disciple. But you know, finally, Jesus got to him. See, Jesus, that day, in that house, disturbed people. Oh, there were a lot of people fired up. The guys on top of the roof, they were going crazy. They were fired up. The paralytic guy, he was all fired up. Because they had faith. Jesus would not let anybody simply think he was a good prophet, a good man that taught a lot of good things. He said, either I'm the son of God or I'm flat a liar and a deceiver and a false prophet. That's disturbing. Of all the men that have ever lived, you cannot leave Jesus alone. Oh, you'll try to miss church a while. You'll be gone. You'll try not to read your Bible. But ask Terrence, it's just disturbing. Yeah. This guy, Jesus. Is he really the Son of God? The one and only? The one that was given power and dominion over all nations, all people, all languages by God. To build a kingdom of these people that would never end. And so when Jesus said, there in Luke 7, The Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. It disturbed these guys. Our fourth point is, The sick be healed. Yeah. Here we have the calling of Levi, or we know him better as Matthew. Verse 27. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. I mean, it doesn't matter what vocation, what your background is, Jesus wants everything. Yeah. you got to be a soul out disciple. There's no other kind. <clears throat> Verse 29. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house. He was really fired up. Yeah. And a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with him. 
But the Pharisees and teachers of law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Now you've got to remember, the concept of holiness, and holy literally means set apart. The concept of holiness is twofold. Number one, you're to stay away from sinful people. And you need to abstain from food and drink. And Jesus didn't either. <laughs> Verse 31. Jesus answered them, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. Jesus is the great physician. And you know, I, I, just, I just kind of chuckle. at you know, Almost every little section, Luke is slipping something in about the medical profession. Do you see that? <laughs> I mean, he enjoyed being a doctor. He enjoyed healing people. He enjoyed saving people. He enjoyed Jesus. And right here, in some ways, is a total slam against the Pharisees and teachers of the law who thought of themselves as so righteous. And Jesus equates being righteous with being healthy, so you don't need a doctor. He says, but the sinners, the sick, they're the ones that need a doctor. They need to be healed. How does healing come? Repentance. Repentance. It's very interesting to me. We study with lots of people trying to help them become true disciples of Jesus Christ. And we get into the Word of God. We lay out from the Word of God the kind of life that Jesus expects. And it's really awesome because we know that everybody that gets baptized, and we'll see four today, every person gets baptized, they've had to look at their life. They were disturbed about Jesus, but they said, listen, there's nothing in this world that I want as much as a personal relationship with God. And then each of these people make the decision to follow Jesus, giving up everything. And they are healed. They are saved. We also have a lot of people that have been a part of our former fellowship and then have wandered around looking from church to church trying to find that something that at one time converted them. And they, they, they can't seem to touch God or feel God like they do because, well, after all, people had let them down. They'd been hurt. They'd been sinned against. And, well, by golly, I'm a little bitter about it. And I don't know if I can trust anybody. But that reminds me of Ace and Pamela McClinton. Oh, yeah. Ace and Pamela right up front here. I appreciate you guys being right up front. I remember meeting Ace and Pamela about a year ago out in Chicago. They had literally been to 50, 60 different churches trying to find a church that practices the teachings of Jesus. And they'd heard many controversial things about us, and they were cautious. But about, I guess about four or five months after we had met, I get this phone call from Ace. He says, hey, this is Ace. You go, hey, Ace. Awesome. He says, we'd like to come out and visit. We have a lot of people who just come out and visit for a weekend. And I said, well, well, what weekend do you want to come? He says, no, 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 I want to come for three weeks. <laughs> Me and my wife and my three kids, we want to see what that church out there is really all about. <laughs> and of course, inferred in that is we don't want someone to pull the wool over our eyes for some weekend. <laughs> So they came, they stayed with disciples. And I remember our big talk just about what it really meant to place membership. And we talked, first of all, about the heart. That if they were going to be members, then they had to be disciples. And they had to repent by forgiving all of those people that had hurt them and learn to trust God and the people that God put into their lives again. And we talked specifically with, with Pamela. She comes from a Jehovah's Witness background. And so she's very hard-lined. <laughs> and 
and uh, she says, well, I don't know about placing membership. Where's placing membership in the Bible? I said, well, right over here in Hebrews chapter 13, we find that, that, that you're to obey your leaders because they got to give an account for you. And here in the church, we got to have your heart and soul dedicated to God or we don't want to be held accountable for your life. She goes, well, that, that makes sense. That's, that's awesome. Okay, we'd like to be members now. <laughs> they placed membership, went back, gave up everything in Chicago, moved on out here in January to start training for the ministry. Well, now not only are they leading a Bible talk in Ontario, but they just took over the ministry out there in Palm Springs, which is about a 60-mile drive where they leave. Now, the amazing thing is, in coming on out here, they had to give up the, the relationships in their business. They're in an IT business. And, they, and Ace told me they had three basic clients. Pam works with them in the business. Well, in moving out here, they lost one of those clients. That's not good. After being out here, they lost a second client. That's really bad. And so their, their finances were getting kind of low. So much so that Pam goes, man, I've got to start looking for another job. And Ace is going, yeah, I've got to try to find some clients. I just don't know anybody out here. So a week ago Saturday, it hit an all-time low. Their money was running out, but they wanted to splurge, so they went to Carl's Jr. <laughs> they go to Carl's Jr. And Pamela goes to the takeout window. She goes, you know something? Do you have an application to work here? That's a little low when you're going, Girls Junior, after you've been working in the IT business. On Sunday, Ace preached for the house church. He just talked about seeking first the kingdom and that God will give you everything you need. And I heard it was full of faith. On Monday, Pam gets a phone call and gets offered a cranking job. Like, like Levi right here, they go out and celebrate. Well, after they celebrated, Ace comes back and finds that he has a new client bigger than what he ever had expected before. Because he preached it, because he lived it, Ace was rewarded by his God. And if you talk to them, they understand that they are healed because they repented. How about it? Are some, are some of you looking for a church, but you're a little bitter about your past experiences? You've seen hypocrisy. You've been hurt. Do you not want to trust people? Well, the solution is simple. You just need to repent. And be a part of a group of disciples that are trying to change the world. Our last challenge is a simple and brief one. The last part of chapter 5. The last challenge is new wine in the new wineskins. Verse 33. They said to him, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours go on eating and drinking. They're talking to Jesus now. Jesus answered, can you make the guests of the bridegroom fast while he's with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. In those days they will fast. Well, of course, the bridegroom is Jesus. And he's talking about that, that, that right now his preaching is a time of celebration. He says it's not a time for fasting and for mourning. It's a time to celebrate. We kind of understand that. Like when we go on vacation, you bag your diet. You know what I'm talking about? Well, that's what Jesus is saying. Just, this is a celebration. This is an awesome time. It's not the time for fasting. And then he lays it out. Verse 36. He told him this parable. No one tears a patch from a new garment and sews it on an old one. If he does, he'll have torn a new garment and the patch from the new will not match the old. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins and the wine will run out and the wineskins will be ruined. No, new wine must be poured out into new wineskins. And no one after drinking old wine wants the new, for he says the old is better. Right here, Jesus lays out, through a very simplistic series of parables, the state of Judaism at that hour. Wow. He says, the state of Judaism 
is so utterly worn out that there must be something completely new. So the first parable, he says, now, any sensitive housewife would not take a new garment and cut out a little patch out of that new garment and try to fix up an old garment. That would be stupid. First of all, it wouldn't match because one's faded and one's the other. But it would ruin the new garment altogether. See, a lot of people just wanted Jesus to kind of meld on in to Judaism. He says, no, it's so utterly decimated. We need something entirely new. The second parable is, if you pour new wine into a brittle old wineskin, it'll burst the wineskin, destroying the old, and it'll destroy the new. You must put new wine into new wineskins. The true teachings of Jesus and the people who truly turn their lives over to Jesus. And finally, the one that trips people up, it says, and no one drinking the old wine wants the new, for he says the old is better. Well, some commentators think that at that particular day, the new wine was more desirable than the old wine. But the point of the passage is very simply this. Some people, after drinking the old wine, the old ways, have so much pride that they refuse to even try something new. They'll say, hey, I'm not trying the new. The old is better. I'm sticking with it. I'm not changing. You know, in some ways, the parallels to this hour are staggering. You know, things in our former fellowship came to such utter despair that back in October 2006, Many of us came together and said, we need to start a new discipling movement for God by pouring new wine into new wineskins and planting new churches. Now at the time, it just seemed so radical. But it became obvious that you can't pour new wine in old wineskins. And that teaching came resoundingly from a little city called Hilo, Hawaii. Elaine and I had got invited to come on over to Hilo, Hawaii and help them on out by their new minister, Kyle Bartholomew. Yeah. And Kyle, Kyle said, hey, you got to come over and help us. I said, well, tell me about the church. Well, at our zenith, we were about 100 people. We had about 60 disciples, but now we're down to about 35, 40, including the kids, and uh, we haven't had a baptism for over a year. I said, bro, now, if you want me and Elaine to come on over, it's going to be controversial. He goes, I know, bro, but there's no alternative. We came on over, and we were opposed by other evangelists on the spot. All we wanted to do was to teach the Word of God and call people to be sold out disciples. After a few days, in the eyes of the world, there was a split. One split of people didn't want to really be sold out. The other 12 went with Kyle, and they all said, listen, we want to be sold out disciples. It's now been a year and a half later. The church has split off. They still have yet to have a baptism. Where there's no faith, there are no miracles. The church that Kyle split with just 12 disciples have had over 30 people baptized into Christ. That being... Even with Kyle and Joan coming back here. Well, why did they come here? Well, because they want to build a mission team to go to Honolulu, Hawaii. And, I mean, it's exciting. I mean, you know, Kyle and Joan have done such a great job over there at Fullerton. Amen, guys? And on the team is going to be Big Dave Wiggins. Amen, right here. Lorenzo Pruitt. Nave Pilot. Joy Axelson. And, and we're, we're trying to twist... Albert Wager's arm a little bit. And there's already a group of 15 disciples that can't wait for the team to get over there to be able to preach the word not only throughout the whole Hawaiian Islands but throughout the entire Pacific Rim. You know, God is moving. This next week, we're going to have a visitor from India, a man that had such deep convictions 
that new wine had to be poured into new wineskin, he resigned from the full-time ministry in our foreign fellowship to start a new church. We now have four churches in India over the past six months. The church in Bombay, Bangalore, the one that Raja Rajan just started, Raja's the one visiting us in Chennai, and just last week we have a new church in New Delhi. Is that exciting? And then very exciting to me, I just heard last week, we now have a new church in Moscow, Russia. You see, it's happening, guys. It's happening. Church is not about coming together and just being with a bunch of people, shaking the hands, and then maybe seeing them next week if you're not busy. Church for Jesus is being a sold-out disciple where you leave everything for the Lord. You embrace his mission to rescue people, but to gather people. To gather people to form churches, to form a movement that propels Jesus' revolution through the message of love by changing each individual one at a time. You see, that's what we have to do. It's a disturbing job, but someone's got to do it. To call the hurting and lost, the fishermen, the lepers, the paralytics, the tax collectors, and even the Pharisees, to ask themselves this basic question, does Jesus have the authority to forgive sin? Thank you. God bless.